Education Department. And um, overall in the city, we have approximately 374 parks, which is a little over 37,000 acres of parkland. Um, and that's um, in the parks master plan, it said that was 23 acres per 1,000 people. Um, and so we have a lot of parks and um, initially, um, so here's, here's the parks department goals. And, and these are new goals. We, we've had our current director for about a year and these, these goals were um, implemented by him. And so um, supporting you know, the mayor's complete communities, which is all about equity in the parks and improving parks. Um, the bottom one is, is focused on natural resources um, and environmental leadership. And um, so if you're looking through all these goals, recreation is a, is a big thing in city parks. And um, so we, you know, we have this goal for natural resources and sometimes these goals conflict. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation, but um, these are good goals and, and I'm glad that um, natural resources is one of them. About five years ago, the natural resources management program was created. Um, with a mission to preserve the biodiversity and natural heritage of Houston uh, by supporting green space preservation and restoring natural communities. Um, most of what we do, a, a big focus of the Natural Resources Program right now is, is habitat restoration um, in our parks. Uh, there's, there was a survey done initially, um, just an aerial survey of all the parks. Approximately 80 of the 374 parks have um, land greater than an acre um, that is undeveloped, so um, would fall under natural resources. And then some of the stuff we do is wildlife. We get, we get a lot of random wildlife things under natural resources too. Uh, so, you know, we were looking at the areas, we were trying to target these specific parks that we wanted to do restoration. And uh, one, of the, one of the first things that happened whenever I came on was we started a, a propagation program. So, um, we go out to, to prairies around Houston, we collect seed. Um, so we've been out to the U of H Coastal Center. Sheldon, we get a lot of grasses from Sheldon in the past, um, Deer Park Prairie um, and, and Nash Prairie, um, which has really just been, you know, a lot of great species that we've been able to grow with volunteers at our greenhouse. So one of the, the, the good things about um, the Parks Department is had a really fancy big greenhouse that um, there was some some space available and historically it was just the, you know for horticulture they um, they were you know take cuttings of non-native species that they plant in the little gardens that um, and so they they had some extra space because they were outsourcing so we were able to um, get get a few rows of tables and start our propagation program and really um, through through mainly master naturalists have really you know created this great uh, volunteer program we meet twice a month um, to you know after we collect the seed and um, and propagate these species and then um, we have our planting events at our restoration sites and um, you know October is busy we're working every Saturday because we have multiple sites that we're planting at. So Clinton Park um, this was our first uh, prairie restoration site. Um, Clinton and Hobart Taylor Park were on the same grant and it was a collaborative grant we had a, a bunch of partners on this one and um, so the you know, the Houston Parks and Recreation Department before natural resources, like the, it, it was maintenance. It's maintaining these grounds. So mowing, grass, ball fields, um, you know, parks for picnics, and, um, and that was all that had been done in, in the Parks Department prior to natural resources. So whenever we, we got these, these sites and we're, we're doing prairie restoration, we have some, you know, this, the city, um, the parks is divided into different divisions. and. So we have a great division manager, which Clinton and um, Hobart Taylor Park fall under, and was willing to give us these parks to do some restoration. Um, one, one benefit of this is it takes takes some acreage out of mowing, so it saves them time. They're able to focus on other areas of the parks. This was this was funded. We we had Jim Willis come out, and you know he had a seed drill and, and put in seed. We had a planting event. And then we needed to mow it because some of the non-native, and we herbicided it first. Um, and so some of the non-native stuff was coming up, we needed to mow it. So we don't have our own equipment. We, we scheduled with our, um, some of our, um, the division out there to come through and mow it. Asked them to meet us out there and we'd, we'd let them know the appropriate way to mow it and everything like that. And they, and they mowed it without letting us know. So um, this, this has been sort of our, 
our struggling site just because this was the first. But it's really, uh, we've learned a lot of lessons from this. Um, so after our plantings and we seeded it, we saw some native species coming up. You know, there were certain areas that were doing better than others. But then once it was mowed and mowed down like a regular parkland, we, we lost a lot of those species. So we came back, um, we had some extra funding, we seeded it again, we had another planting event. And then we had, a, we had another setback with mowing. Um, and so, um, and then recently for the, I don't know why this has really just been a struggle, but um, the, you can see there's a, there's a little um, asphalt trail around the site and it had really been filled up with silt and, and sediment and, and they wanted to um, repour the asphalt. So our maintenance group came and scraped the trail and then they needed somewhere to dump their uh, the stuff. So, so that got dumped on the prairie and um, I ended up there a few days later and, um, and it looked like it had been tilled. So I couldn't tell because it was just like our plants and a bunch of dirt and I thought someone had tilled it. So, um, but I, I ended up finding out that that had just that it had been scraped and, and they, they dumped it in the prairie. So I think the lesson from this one is education. Um, and, and so I've really been trying this year to go out and I've talked to our, uh, you know, the, the different groups throughout the city meet, the superintendents and division managers, and um, going out to sort of educate them. Um, and we had done that previously a little bit. This time I focused on money. So it was telling them how much it costs me every time this prairie is mowed down to the ground or every time uh, dirt, is, and, it's, and I added it all up and it's very expensive uh, to, for the initial. Uh, so one thing I didn't want to do was say, it's really expensive to do prairie. So I didn't want it to be focused on that, but initially it is expensive and then much cheaper than if you're just mowing it on a regular cycle. So I, I definitely wanted to stress that. Um, and so I think, I think it's getting better, and now we have actually have a designated uh, person, he's one of the field supervisors, who does great. And so I had him mow this site recently, uh, because we have a planting event here this weekend, and he did it great. He mowed it at the height I told him to, everything was great. So I think having, you know, the designated person, and this winter we're going to have trainings um, to where we come in and select throughout the divisions you know, that one really excellent um, field supervisor um, that, that is dedicated to green infrastructure. So we're doing a whole green infrastructure training. If you are nominated by your superintendent, then you can go to this training and you are the only person in your division that can maintain any of these uh, green infrastructure projects. So that's what we're leaning towards that, not just letting anyone come and maintain them. So I think this, this has really been, um, a site where we were it was our first one so we're learning from it um, one thing about this site is it, it, this is really wet and this is clay so it doesn't appear to have been filled uh, we try and you know we looked at the historic aerials and really wanted to restore these sites to what they historically were um, sometimes some of our, our sites were already developed from the from the imagery that we can get but um, this one was I mean when it's dry, there's cracks in the ground. When it's wet, you know, it's just like you get sucked in the ground. It's like really, really good clay. Um, from, from what I can tell at this site is the seeding this site has been um, less successful than our other sites. And, um, and I don't know if it's just like it's so wet out here that the seed is less successful. That, and it's a little bit drier on this side and it seems that the seed has done um, better up there. So we have, we did random vegetation plots. Um, they kind of ended up in the same area of the prairie, unfortunately with random, and I guess you can't see that on there. But so I looked at, we did over the past year, this vegetation data has been collected, and it, which started about two and a half years after the initial prairie site um, was started. And I pulled the top two dominant species from each plot throughout the year um, that had been collected. And so the the one that showed up in the most plots, in all five plots as a dominant, was Dallas grass. So this site started out as mowed parkland. It was Dallas grass, it was Bahia grass, uh, Bermuda grass, um, and those, it, it's, it's been a challenge um, having that to be, you know, our starting condition. Um, and so I would say, you know, from other places, I've worked in organizations before where conservation was the, the focus. 
um, which, which is not for the parks department, but it is for my group. Um, I, but I don't have my own equipment. So I would say, and I talk about challenges later, but I would say that um, trying to manage something when you can't mow it when you, at the right time when you want to um, is a challenge. Um, so we, we have to get someone, our, our person to mow it on overtime on a Saturday, but if it rains, you know, the Saturday he's supposed to mow it and he can't do it the next Saturday. So it, it's just um, some, some issues with that in, in some of our sites. Um, I would say that if you're looking at the vegetation plot data, I mean, it, it's predominantly still non-native species and we're, uh, we're, we're in year three right now. But there is some native stuff coming and there's, there's some areas where we've had our, our planting events um, where, you know, what's doing really well in these wet areas is gamma grass is fantastic. There's huge stands of gamma grass that didn't show up in our plot, so it's not reflected, but, um, and Texas cone flowers doing great. Uh, so I would say, you know, we're focusing, we want to get this more diverse, but when we plant this Saturday, we're planting more of those species just to try and get this stuff going and then come in later. Uh, I can see that the, you know, our, our one gallon pot, so we have 1,500 scheduled to go in on Saturday. And you can see that those are successful. The, the plantings that we have are successful. The seed has been a little bit more difficult here. And right now, we, we can't go back in an herbicide. So I've heard Jaime talk about his, you know, urban sites before. You know, you have one shot, really, with, with these sites. And um, there's no way that they would let me come and completely herbicide it again so I could reseed it. And I have money for seed. I have a ton of seed, right? I got a grant for seed. But I, I can't go wipe out what's there now. It would not be acceptable to, like, remove this prairie. And um, so, I, you know, there are bare areas. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we will focus our seeding, and we're hand seeding this. So the first two times, it was a seed drill. This time, we're just going out to hand seed. I think an another issue with I wanted to have it mowed a couple of times before seeding, but I barely got it mowed once. So I think that um, that was a little bit of an issue. Uh, but I, I see hope, and now I, I'm starting to see, you know, some of the, the good species coming up. We've had, this has probably been one of our most challenging sites because there, this is a row of houses here. Uh, and this, this is over in, you know, uh, just north of the ship channel. It's like Galena Park area. Um, so the, the people here who were used to this mode, nice, you know, big play area, um, have not been ex accepting of, of prairie restoration. And we came in and we put a split rail fence all around this site for that reason, um, which has helped, it, it seems, that having that has helped. Um, just to let them know that we're not being lazy, we don't just not want to mow the site, but we're actually doing something um, and getting interpretive signage um, is helpful too. So th this is a seven acre site, um, which was the, on the same grant um, as Clinton Park. So it happened at the same time. Uh, this didn't have as many problems. It did get mowed portion of it, but we caught them halfway through this one. So, um, so not as bad, but I would say that the, you know, from looking at these sites before we started, this is all fill material. If you dig a hole to dig a plant in the ground here, you're digging up oyster shell, glass, um, who knows? Um, and so, and it's a mound. So if you're standing, you know, in the parking lot looking out, you can see the mound of prairie, you know. And so I, I just thought this was going to be a disaster. But um, actually, this site looks better than Clinton Park. Um, and so in the plants that we're planting out there, don't mind the fill, apparently. They, they're doing just fine. Um, the seed has done well. It, this site isn't very wet. So this one looks a little bit better. And it's a little bit more diverse if you look at the dominant species that we're seeing in our plots. Dallas grass is still the um, showing up in all the plots as the dominant species, uh, but it's a lot more diverse. So there's goldenrod and, um, and some other um, Cherokee sedge and stuff that, that are showing up, and, and little blue stem is starting to spread throughout this site. So I think this one is promising. The community really hasn't um, had a say either way. They haven't had anything negative, or, and we really haven't gotten them involved in the site successfully yet. Um, but hopefully, as things progress, um, that will change too. Robert C. Stewart Park, this is one that before the Natural Resources Program began, 
Um, there was a group um, with the Sierra Club and, and the local neighborhood that wanted to have this as a nature park. So they put in a small grant and had some of the area cleared and seeded. Apparently, um, some of the site was seeded with Bermuda grass because the contractor felt that um, they weren't using those right species. So you can see that reflected in some of this. But uh, by the time the Natural Resources Program came on, most of it um, was just reforested. Um, so they had done, you know, some of this part prairie, and this is Sims Bayou right here. Um, and so this is this is a riparian zone that we're working on um, and leaving that forested. And and you know, some of these are native tree species, so that the transition area will be, you know, we, we will have trees in that. But much of this is being cleared. Um, you know, there's. There's native and non-native species here, but we're, we're restoring um, this back to prairie, and, and most of these are really small, early, early trees um, that are coming in. And so the dominant species for this, so this is where the, the meter square herbaceous plots, um, and so really high native species on this one, um, and then the, the forested plots, um, the, the areas, you know, this is covered up um, in trees where, you know, hackberry was, you know, a dominant, um, and then um, ligustrum is, is a big one at that park, and also tallow. We've been working to remove tallow. So what you see underneath the trees here, they're, they're young trees. They're, there's, native, there's a mix of native and non-native that, that are showing up at this site. So I'm, I'm really hoping that this one is going to be, and I'm almost certain that it will, be easier than the mowed um, parkland site. So I, I, it's more, a little bit more expensive to you know come in and clear out all of these trees but then after that you know what we're seeing when we're clearing up this goldenrod's coming in it's not dallas grass it's, it's goldenrod so um then we're coming through and we're, we're doing our plantings with you know within the goldenrod which will which is great and um so i predict that this will be um you know more acceptable and this is already a nature park i'd say for this one um you know there's a lot of homeless people that sleep in this park and we've had some uh, comments from the community recently that were, wanted us to come through. And you know, I'm leaving a forested buffer along the edge of the park. Just it's a really great birding park. And you can go on eBird and see Robert C. Stewart Park. And um, there's a lot of species that are seen at this site. Um, but having this forested buffer for the wildlife and also, um, you know, for the community. Um, you know, with, with patches, so if you're driving by, you can see inside that it's prairie, but, but overall having this forested border. Um, but we've had complaints from the community that want us to come in and clear all of that out. So recently, this has been my one where I've, I've been going to the Civic Club and just trying to educate the community about, you know, why we're working on this site. And, and normally, you know, whenever I go talk to a group, they seem really receptive to what I'm saying, and I had a contractor come in and kind of clear out um, the buffer for this. Um, was, it, it, it was along this side in this community, so the buffer was kind of thick underneath the tree, so we had cleared out a little bit of that understory um, to make them be able to see a little bit in and feel more safe. They were worried about whenever they were walking down the street that someone was going to grab them and put them in the park. and um, so. That, that's one of our struggle, struggles in the urban sites, right? They're, they're surrounded by these neighborhoods. And um, really, you know, I would say that a strong determinant of what happens in your local park is, is what, what the council member is hearing and what the parks director is hearing from the community. So if people are supporting um, natural resources, natural habitat and prairies and forests, then, then that's what they'll see in their park. But mostly it's special interest groups and they want to, they want to have a baseball field or they, so I think, you know, having input from, from the, from your community, um, if you live in Houston and letting your council member know that, you know, this is the type of park that you would like to have, because I think in the past, um, nature wasn't really an option, um, as one of the things that you would like to see at your park, if you were given a list. Um, and so, and it should be. And so I don't know if people even know to ask for that. Um, but, but we have these great nature parks and, and some of our parks have these, you know, forested areas that were historic prairie that are fenced off and you don't even know it's part of the mode parkland. Um, and that's something that, you know, I'll take because then I could restore that. So it, no one would be upset if I took it, if they didn't even know it was park to begin with. But Blackhawk Park, this one, um, 
we've been working on, and we just got another grant for this one. It's a 47 acre site. Uh, and this is off of Fuquay. It's um, the Beltway 8 South and um, Gulf Freeway. And so w we have our vegetation plots in this area. And um, this is a mix, but predominantly, so I would say um, this area, we just had this area chipped. Uh, so it was all, you know, all the stuff was mulch except for the big native trees. And um, this was almost 100% glossy privet. Um, and, Chin and Chinese privet mixed in, and a few tallow. And um, so, and you can see this was really, really great habitat um, historically. This was a 44 aerial. And so we came in and we, we we're clearing out some of this, and I haven't really heard any uh, feedback from the community yet because we started here where no one can see. Um, and so, and, and that was really the very dense ligustrum. So um, we are, we have a grant and we'll probably be working in this section. Um, this will start this spring. We have an event October 27th where we do an invasive species removal event. So this is really geared at um, teaching the community what the species are at the site, that they're non-native because I, you know, we all are bracing for your cutting down trees, which is what we're doing. This site, if you're looking at the site, this is a forested park, but it's ligustrum and tallow and um, so, but, but no one knows that. It, and, and in my favor, you know, Clinton Park is Dallas grass, but the regular community doesn't know that that's not brown seed past palum. So um, I think, and, and even some of the, one thing I didn't mention about those prairie sites is we seed them with wildflowers pretty heavily. And that gets us support. So even though the, the dominant species right now is Dallas grass, we get support because it's full of wildflowers. And so I'm gonna do that every year. Uh, so in, until I can get some of these grasses, uh, these native grasses going, um, definitely. And, and even some of the non-native, like the ranunculus was really dominant. They don't care. I mean, it's a, it's a yellow flower and it's in the prairie. So I had like positive feedback when that was covering the prairie at one point. I was like, I'll take it. <laughs> but but so, um, so I think we're just, we're doing this invasive species removal event just to get the let the community know about these species and there's not that many i mean it's really just heavy ligustrum uh, and tallow out here so just teaching them what these species are um, and and the benefits of native species and we're leaving you know this area for because this is a drainage and it ends up in in clear creek so we're leaving a little bit of a riparian buffer um, and the big native trees in there for now and then um, and just really letting them know the benefits of natives and that's what this event is and then in March uh, we're going to come out and plant this site we're going to seed the site with wildflowers there is an area that um, I'm hoping to get mowed before the event that um, probably just an acre I mean it's really thick with baccarat in this area but there's not that many trees so we're hoping to get in with the bat wing and kind of knock some of that out and seed one section with wildflowers and native grasses but I mean there's there's good native stuff in here too um, you know, I was out earlier in the week collecting long spike tridents, and I have a huge bag of long spike tridents from this site, which is, you know, a forested site, but, you know, there, there's patches in here, and there's native stuff um, all along this area. So, so I, I'm excited about this one. I think this one's going to be a good site. And I didn't, I didn't put it on this, but we're starting one. Uh, Silver Rodriguez Park in Clear Lake is starting um, any, any month now. Uh, we, we just have to get the contract signed. So that's a 72-acre um, restoration site which is going to be prairie with the riparian border along Horsepin Bayou um, and so and that has really good stuff in it and that was historic prairie pothole and it's just covered in tallow right now but we're coming to have that chipped and um, so that should be exciting and, and this is a this is the chipped area Blackhawk so this is the before picture and this is the the after picture it was really really dense and I didn't really even include the herbaceous um, vegetation data for this site because there was none. I mean, it was so dense that, you know, if you, when you come through and, you know, get in between these trees, there's just no, you know, the, the plots that they did and, and we had them done, it was 95% bare, either bare or litter. So the herbaceous really just isn't there right now. And now it's covered in mulch. So we have seed for this site and um, hopefully we can get that seeded uh, when some of this breaks down. Right now we're looking um, to do invasive species 
um, inventory through the park. So I'm just really interested on seeing um, the distribution of invasive species throughout parks. And so we have uh, 30 foot diameter plots that we're just randomly selecting through some of our natural areas. And we're going out and we have a set list of species, which is easy. And it's easy for interns to help with um, because they only have to know this certain species ID. Um, and then we're doing, you know, percent cover of these invasive species throughout the sites. And um, just seeing, you know, what, and this is Stewart Park. This is the invasive species done in Stewart Park. Just to see what these species are. So Dallas grass was added to that because that's one of our big ones. And, and that was Milby Park and Clinton Park and Hobart Taylor Park. Um, so those were all the mowed park sites, but Dallas grass didn't show up in any of the sites that had forested vegetation. No. Uh, it sounds like you have a lot of frustration in your job. No, it's just different. So I, I worked in conservation organizations before where that is your focus. Um, and I think it, I, I love it. It's exciting that we're changing. So it's a, it's a slow turn, but it's a turn. It's a turn toward conservation. And, and definitely the parks department is, definitely turning toward green infrastructure. I mean, that's that's one of the goals. Um, it's just, there's old ways, you know, it's hard to get someone who's mowed grass for 30 years to understand that, you know, some, the height needs to be set at eight inches high. I mean, it's just, it doesn't make sense and they're not natural resources people. So there's two natural resources people in Houston Parks and Recreation Department, um, you know, out of thousands of people. So trying to reach all of those people and, and some, uh, many of our maintenance people don't speak English. So, and, or, you know, and it's just and us reaching them. So we can reach their division managers and their superintendents, but does the message get relayed to their crews? And so um, I think that's definitely improving. So Clinton Park was, you know, a couple years ago, and now they mowed it perfectly. So it was done perfectly, and we've done outreach, and, uh, and now, you know, and we, it's, it's our fault too. We've been slow on this catching on that, you know, this isn't what other people do. This is what I do, but this isn't what these crews do. They mow parkland. So I think that's, that's our fault too, but we're starting this training and this winter we're doing training and offering this training to any division that would like to send their people on how to maintain green infrastructure. And so, and we should have done that from the start. Yeah. Downstream of Sylvan Rodriguez? Yeah, downstream mm -hmm. and south of Sylvan Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if Sylvan Rodriguez can impact that in terms of its development as a park or if the closeness to the airport is going to be able to limit that. So it's already natural. We're not developing, so it's not going to be further developed, this area that we have our restoration. So we wouldn't be, you know, increasing flooding. Well, Hopefully... You know, and it's trees now, so I don't know that we would impact flooding that much because it's already natural. We're not creating it. Um, maybe some. I mean, it was hopefully that, you know, it could hold more water once we do the prairie restoration there. Um, but, yeah, I think, you know, one of the big things for that is, is water quality. I, I'm, I'm certain that we would impact the water quality, which horse pen doesn't meet for that. Um, and then also having this site... Um, preserved, you know, that it had a whole master plan on it. It was slated to be developed into ball fields and everything. And really the community spoke up about, you know, that they wanted to leave this park natural. So that would impact flooding. If they would have put all those ball fields in on this wetland area, then that would have impacted flooding. And, and actually there was a talk about model ducks earlier. And, um, you know, whenever I was out, I was doing a wetland delineation at the site and one of the potholes, half of its mowed, so you can really see it and it holds water. And there were model ducks swimming in that mowed, mowed park, swimming in that. So I'm, I'm certain that, you know, our restoration will impact the wildlife in that area. Uh, so we're hoping to, for the invasive species inventory just to get a, a distribution on, you know, what types of habitats these species are showing up in and, um, you know, for the future to see um, you know, what our management methods are so we can create an invasive species management plan um, for the park system. Um, so, Ligustrum, these are um, glossy and Chinese privet. Um, and then, uh, and that's um, Dallas grass. Mm -hmm. So, this is Blackhawk Park, which was the privet. 
Um, no, tallow actually, but these are plots. So all, all of my stuff is plots. They're randomly selected. Um, so it gives you an idea. Like you could see the Dallas grass and the prairie plots was, was a dominant species, but it, it wasn't telling you the big patch of gamma grass that was right next to the plot. So it gives you an idea, and it definitely tells me, you know, if all five of these plots had dominant Dallas grass, that I need a better prairie restoration process happening. Um, but there, there is things that the plots don't show. Um, and so um, tallow it just didn't happen to be in, in these plots, uh, but, but it's there. And it, it's, it's, every, it's in all of the parks, 100% of the parks. And Hobart Taylor, um, you know, the seven acre one, is surrounded by Chinese tallow trees. So everything around that prairie is Chinese tallow, and, and it's just seeding the prairie. So we're, we're going through now and removing the tallow. And one thing with that site is that, you know, a tree is a tree to these communities. So we can't just go in. There's 100 of them. We counted them. There's 100 tallow trees that are around that prairie. And we can't just go in and remove 100 trees from a park. So we're, we're, we removed probably 30 so far. And then we have uh, 50 large 100-gallon native trees that are um, going into the site. So right before we put those big native trees in, we're probably going to remove another 30, put the native trees in, let them grow up a little, and then remove the rest of the tallow. And so it, that's just the process. So if, you know, if we're at a big, you know, restoration site like this and there's tallow, we can just remove the tallow, you know, and that's acceptable, but it's just a little bit different management uh, for parks. Um, but, you know, education is one thing that, that we're working on and letting people know that, you know, Chinese tallow is not, yeah. But there's two of us, so we're, we're trying to get around, we're just getting around slow. Um, um, so some of the challenges, um, Probably the number one challenge would be other park uses, trying to advocate for natural resources and that once you develop these parks, once you put a ball field, then um, that's it. You know, you've destroyed the habitat. It's really hard to get that back. Uh, but I think there is, there is strong support now for, for natural resources and hopefully um, that will be more acceptable. Uh, community support, getting the, educating the community and get, getting them to be supportive of doing restoration in their park because these are their parks and, and a lot of these communities are, have very strong opinions on what happens in their parks. So, so putting that out there and getting support for natural resources. Uh, I mentioned equipment. We, we just have to work with, you know, when we can get equipment, two staff members um, for, for 80 parks. Um, and then the distance, I think this is, this is the interesting thing that I've been getting used to is, you know, we have these planting events. We have to move all of our plants across town to plant at our restoration site. So it takes a day to load up plants, take them down to our prairie restoration site, unload the plants, and then multiple trips in our trailer to get enough plants at these sites for events. So that, that's something that I hadn't dealt with before working for the city, but, but the distance. And then also we, we just had a planting event, at, um, a tree planting at our, one of our riparian restoration sites. And I, had, I was out there in August, and we had a problem with ragweed growing up and shading out some of our small native trees that we're planting in this site. But it was cleared out in August, and our native trees were looking good. Then we just had a planting out there, and I didn't have time to make it out there before the planting event. And the ragweed was, you know, 10 feet tall over the trees and because I, I couldn't make it out to the site. We have too many there all over town. Um, so that was a lesson too. So we're struggling to like clear an area of ragweed so that we could plant our trees before. So I think the distance between our sites is definitely um, a little bit of a challenge. And then I put funding under this. We're, we're, the natural resources is 100% grant funded. But you know, after you know, seeing all these nonprofits here, I think funding should probably move over into opportunities because I don't have to fund my salary so I can use my salary for match. Um, so nonprofits have to raise money to pay their employees and for their restoration. So I think that that's actually probably an opportunity um, that, that I'm lucky that the city pays my salary. I don't have to, to worry about funding myself. And so that money can go, everything that I write in a grant is for that, that site, um, to, to restore that site. Um, some of the opportunities, that I've, I've just been really excited about the different types of habitats that I'm able to work in. If one is frustrating, the other one is great and it's fun and um, there's just so many different um, parks to work at. I'll never get bored, ever. 
uh, because there's just so many different um, habitats within the city. Um, and then the research opportunities are, are limitless. It's all throughout Houston. We have parks um, all around town that, that we can work in. And so, um, you know, ha doing research on, on methods and, and it, it's just limitless. And then, and then working with multiple communities. So a lot of these parks has friends groups and, um, and just the local communities that are supporting um, some of this work that we get to work with. It's, um, it's, really, it's really great to, have, to get to work with different groups of people for these parks. And so a couple of things that we're working on now um, that would support some of our um, prairie habitat sites is right now we're, we're working on a policy to limit the trees that are planted in parks. So there's a list of trees, they're all native, and if it's not on this list, then no one can plant it in a park. So that's, that's what we're trying to do, and that would limit the spread of invasive species. We don't want to keep putting in trees that aren't native in parks um, or on city property at all. So hopefully we get it citywide, so any property, so uh, um, any type of, um, you know, any of these plans that are going on the sites, the, the consultants would have to consult this list to have them in the parks. And so I think that, um, you know, pushing this forward has been, you know, one of the really exciting things that, that everyone just seemed really open to in the Parks Department and um, I think will really benefit prairie habitat and just habitat throughout Houston. And then we're looking, uh, we're, we've also got a policy in to create nature preserves and parks so that we could designate these areas um, as nature preserves on city parks. Um, I think it would really be, you know, very supportive of saying the city has nature preserves. Not that we're, we're just restoring this park, but we have nature preserves. And this is one of the important things that uh, we provide to our citizens is, is nature. Um, and then th those areas cannot be developed in the future. Thank you.